uh, Anna Yerevska, who is not only an advisor to uh, uh, the BCC and Chamber Customs, but also is a renowned expert in uh, the, this area of trade and, uh, and customs. So welcome to you, Anna. It's good to see you this morning. And um, so I, I'm going to uh, kick off and, uh, and, and, and just uh, start to share my screen. And, and I'm going to kick off by talking about uh, uh, free trade and what free trade agreements are and what benefits they bring. Uh, Anna will then talk in a more detailed and granular way about the, the wins that we've had in terms of free trade so far since we left the single market uh, and relied on the trade agreements made by the European Union. Uh, uh, and also some of the trade, the, the negotiations that continue to take place uh, uh, and, and the way that the government would like us to progress as a uh, trading partner across the globe. So um, before I do that, I should explain a couple of things. One is that if you want to ask any questions, there will be uh, a Q&A uh, opportunity uh, uh, near the end once we've uh, we've spoken. Uh, but please, uh, if you can, if you would be prepared to uh, put your a question in the uh, using the chat the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen, and that will allow us to uh, sometimes create similar questions uh, and try to respond to as many of your questions as we can. So please uh, uh, bring them forward. Um, uh, secondly, uh, I should say that the slides that we use today uh, will be sent out to everyone who's attended. Uh, uh, so uh, you don't need to you know, uh, be making notes unless you really want to, uh, because we will share uh, that uh, small deck with you. Uh, at the end. So uh, moving uh, moving on then, uh, uh, if uh, Heidi, if you could take down your, uh, that's great, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll move on to uh, uh, share my slides. Um, so uh, just starting off with the kind of, uh, oh, something's not going uh, right there. Uh, let me try again. No, that didn't that didn't work. Just give me one second to try to uh, share this uh, deck. Yeah, I think we're probably. Yeah, that should work now. Okay, so no, it hasn't worked. Uh, and only a moment ago when I tested this, everything went absolutely fine. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, share my slides this way rather than in presenter mode. So what what is free trade? Well, the idea of free trade is that things should be able to uh, uh, be traded between countries with as few restrictions or limitations as possible. And every nation typically uh, will, will tax uh, import goods uh, into their country in the absence of a free trade agreement. And sometimes even when there is a free, free trade agreement, um, but they will also limit the volume of goods uh, import through something called tariff rate quotas. And the will often place restrictions on the import of some goods on security grounds. And actually, they often restrict the export of some goods on similar security grounds. So some examples of uh, uh, taxes and tariffs would be uh, tariffs on, say, steel, uh, which are a flat rate 25% uh, uh, typically uh, for goods arriving in the UK because we want to protect our steel industry. And we do that through... Uh, issuing or negotiating tariff rate quotas uh, for goods from a number of different markets that can come into the UK without paying 25% uh, uh, tariff, but only up to a certain tonnage in, in a range of uh, uh, classifications. Um, and so that means that once the tariff uh, rate quota is exhausted, then all of the volume of steel that comes in beyond the quota uh, is subject to 25%. Uh, a tariff. Um, uh, also, uh, you know, typically we will, where we sign a trade agreement, we will lift the tariff on many goods, particularly goods that we don't produce in our country. So, for example, the, the tariff on mangoes would typically be zero because we don't grow mangoes. Uh, uh, whereas the because we produce steel and we want to offer some protection to our own steel industry, uh, what we do is we levy a tariff or provide for a quota. Uh, from countries with whom we have trade agreements. And then on the security grounds, uh, uh, some people old enough will remember the 
uh, the the uh, company in the UK that was prosecuted for selling pipes to, I think, uh, a, a, a Iran, uh, and, and the, the, these were going to be manufactured into guns, so there's the, or, or missile launchers. Um, so there are restrictions for some countries and goods that are going to go to that country that could be used for the purposes of military purposes. So even something like a, a laptop that could be uh, uh, used uh, to operate missile systems uh, has to have special licensing arrangements in place to, to export. So there's a whole licensing system within the UK, for example, for goods that are being exported, uh, and, the, and, and a similar uh, process applies for the importation of goods uh, that are restricted for either security, safety uh, grounds, or because they are instruments of torture, for example, uh, and, uh, and a range of other goods are subject to uh, special measures. So free trade, though, free trade agreements can have the effect of removing or lessening some of those restrictions. And that's why we enter into those uh, agreement to free trade arrangements with other countries. Um, so what are the benefits? Well, number one benefit of, of, of free trade agreements and trade typically is that the trade promotes peace. Uh, it's very basic level. Um, it, it's, you know, it would be unusual for uh, countries at war to actually be trading uh, between those countries as well. So it is a promoter of peace. Um, it connects countries, it promotes uh, and protects our core outputs through those things like tariff-free quotas, certainly promotes trade and partnership, uh, and, and will often include mutual recognition of, of things like the, our standards uh, 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 on goods and the way that good, the goods are made. So it, it promotes better uh, the production of better goods uh, very often. Its aim is to deliver economic growth. I think uh, there are a number of commentators might question the effect to which uh, uh, a free trade agreement delivers on economic growth, but certainly uh, that's its aim. Uh, the, the free trade agreements also are often about security, so there will be uh, uh, the trade agreements may in self deal with uh, goods and services, but actually the, the reaching free trade agreements also uh, typically will also uh, uh, help with matters of security between our respective countries. Um, they certainly are designed to promote prosperity, trust, and, and often not only trade, but aid. Uh, and, and so our sphere of influence uh, through the delivery of aid in developing countries uh, can have a positive impact on trade between our countries. And these trade agreements are typically good for business because they offer preferential tariffs. So a preferential tariff would be where um, the tariff was lower uh, uh, or, or zero uh, for goods uh, leaving the UK, going into a trade partner country. Um, and that gives us a competitive advantage uh, over um, a, a competitor who may be exporting from a, a country where there is no free trade agreement with the destination market. So preferential tariffs make us more competitive for our, our, our exports, and they also have the effect of lowering the cost of imports, uh, and, and, and that passes down to our consumers. They also are good for business because they typically also have, uh, have uh, uh, chapters on the movement of people, the flow of data, and you think of the Japan agreement where uh, the, the, the flow of data was very at the forefront of that agreement uh, and, and, and uh, an apparent advantage over the e Japan-EU agreement. Uh, they're often uh, help with the flow of money and the treatment of tax, where there are mutual tax uh, arrangements in place. And they are, we should remember, a bit more than just goods and often uh, uh, cover services. And that's something the UK government has been very keen to uh, promote uh, uh, is the, the services elements. Um, so what's the value of, of trade or continuity agreements? These are the agreements, Anna will talk about these, but these are the agreements that we already had as part of the single market uh, negotiated between the EU and other countries uh, and, and our uh, Department of International Trade uh, set out to uh, have these agreements carry forward in what they call continuity agreements um, with 67 countries, uh, 165 billion pounds of trade uh, and, and a, a ballpark around 24% of exports, 25% of imports. EU trade is now 27 countries uh, now that we've left uh, and it's a significant proportion of our imports and exports into those 27 markets, a, a substantial, you know, 300 billion pounds of exports, 372 billion pounds of imports, and, and you can see significantly more than the continuity agreements uh, that were uh, um, uh, all uh, ultimately uh, uh, rolled over 
uh, into continuity agreements between UK and those markets. Um, just to kind of looking at the value of trade, I think it's worth uh, remembering that whilst we uh, uh, governments make trade agreements, it's businesses that do trade. And a good example uh, to highlight that is that the biggest market that we trade with in terms of value uh, for, for export and import is the United States of America, where we don't have a trade agreement. Uh, and again, something that Anna may speak to uh, more later, but those 10, 10 markets account for 60% of our trade, 60% of import, 60% of, of our exports. Uh, and there are, um, you know, big market in terms of US, which when we ask in our surveys, when we ask businesses, what's the market they would most like to enter and, and trade with, uh, it comes consistently at the top of that list. Well, no surprise, because it is our biggest market, but we currently don't have a trade agreement. And you can see reading down the rest of the, the other markets are, uh, uh, apart from China, the rest would be within the uh, European European Union, so uh, um, you know significant markets for us and significant value of trade. So hopefully that sets as a, a backdrop, if you like, uh, uh, an introduction to uh, what trade trade agreements are are, are, are about. Um, I'm going to turn to Anna now uh, and, and and ask Anna to uh, um, uh, address uh, um, a, a, a number of questions relating to free trade. So Anna, over to you. Thanks, Liam. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, so, so as, as Leah mentioned, the UK government managed to sign a number of these rollover agreements. In fact, according to the UK government, the, the, the ones that we were not able to sign, meaning the ones that we had as a member of the EU but we don't have now, are Algeria, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Montenegro. So uh, not that many uh, that, that are left uh, unsigned. So I think one of the important things here is this, to stress that these are continuity agreements, so these are rollover agreements, and that's not always been uh, sufficiently highlighted when we got official announcements and, and press releases around these trade agreements, that in fact, these agreements are not as much about new benefits, they are really about minimizing the impact of Brexit and providing, as the name suggests, continuity of trade. Uh, meaning, you know, as, as much continuity as, as obviously uh, is possible. And we'll talk in a second about what we've gained versus what we've lost and what the changes are. But uh, the fact that we were able to roll over all of these trade agreements is actually a, a massive success for the UK government. Initially, when, uh, well, five years ago, when we talked about Brexit and so on, uh, many observers, myself included, didn't think that was possible. So that, you know, that is a substantial success uh, that we were able to sign all these agreements, get these countries to, to agree to some of the provisions that I'll mention later. So, you know, that is very well done for, to, to the UK government on, on that front. So in terms of the actual agreements uh, with, with, with the countries, they differ substantially. So all these trade agreements are slightly different, as you would expect, given that these are agreements with, with separate um, separate countries. Some of them are literally a couple of pages that say uh, when you take the EU agreement with that country, replace the EU and uh, paste in uh, the United Kingdom in, in certain places and, and a couple more details. But some of them are actually almost full agreements in terms of length and, uh, and, and scope. They also differ in terms of what they cover and how much they were able to provide that um, continuity. So for example, with Canada and Mexico, we've had continuity agreements, but now they will be renegotiated. We'll have a new uh, kind of bespoke agreement with, with these two countries. And there's actually a call for input uh, open at the moment. So the UK government is asking companies if you have any interests, any, 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 anything that you'd like to see in, uh, in a trade agreement with Canada or Mexico, you can uh, go to the website, the UK government's website and, and provide input. So these two will be renegotiated. Um, uh, there, for example, the uh, GSP, so uh, an agreement that's unilateral, it's basically the UK providing tariff-free access or reduced tariffs for developing and least developed countries. This is, uh, the agreement is referred to as GSP, General Scheme of Preferences. That has been copied from the EU and the UK kind of adopted uh, the EU version of that 
agreement. However, it will also be renegoti renegotiated and the, the UK government is also looking for input to see how they could structure that in, in a different way and how it could make this agreement a bit better. Some other agreements are kind of work in progress or were work in progress. So for example, the UK's agreements with Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. Initially that agreement only covered goods. Now in June, there was an update to that agreement that covers uh, other areas as well, such as services and investment. So there is progress there. With Switzerland, uh, the agreement is also going through and will continue to go through certain uh, developments, in, especially when it comes to mutual recognition agreements, because we're talking here about free trade agreements. But there are also other types of agreements that are generally associated with trade, uh, free trade agreements or attached to them or sometimes happen independently of free trade agreements. But if you look at a, at a UK's relationship with some of these country as a EU mem as an EU member, that relationship wasn't based solely on a free trade agreement. There were other agreements that were also replicating and trying to uh, to to get the, um, the the kind of the same effect. So these could be yeah mutual recognition agreements, agreements around financial services uh, and, and different types of uh, agreements as well. Uh, South Korea is another one where there will need to be a renegotiation of, of at least part of that agreement around rules of origin and some around tariff quotas. Turkey, Turkey is obviously an interesting one because it was uh, a member of a customs union um, with the EU. It was, it was, it has or it has a customs union with the EU, and obviously our relationship could not be um, replicated in, in in that way because we're no longer part of of the EU. So instead of a Customs Union will now have a free trade agreement, which uh, replicates some of that relationship, but obviously is a completely different uh, level of, of uh, integration. So that agreement will be updated and and will continue to evolve um, as we as we kind of uh, move uh, forward. Um, however, again, that, that there's there's a commitment to to, to update that agreement um, as as uh, as time goes uh, goes by. However, the first one that the UK government announced was was a new trade agreement. First post Brexit trade agreement was the agreement with Japan, which obviously uh, uh, is is a bit of a controversial statement because it's also a rollover agreement. It's definitely very much a continuity agreement. However, this one was not a simple copy paste, but there were some changes included. Now, when I look at these changes, I still feel that this is a, a tweaked version of the EU-Japan agreement. I really don't see these changes um, being substantial enough to call it a, a, a standalone new trade agreement, but they are important changes that, that in, if you're in that industry where, where the change uh, took place, you know, that, that might uh, make a difference. It was still very much a um, kind of a last minute deal. If you remember, initially, Japan was not interested in a rollover agreement. And for, the, for a long time, we thought we won't get that agreement. And then in the last minute, when probably Japanese uh, companies realized that this is actually happening, the UK won't uh, back down and that Brexit is taking place. And they pushed their government to agree uh, to something that would provide some sort of continuity for UK for Japanese businesses and for UK businesses as well. So there were some changes in terms of uh, tariffs. There were a couple of tariff lines on the UK side uh, in the auto industry and about nine uh, tariff lines or 10 tariff lines on the on uh, Japanese side that were uh, liberalized quicker or reduced quicker than in the EU version of that agreement. Uh, there were some product specific rules of origin that changed. There's accumulation, which I'll mention in a second, um, that was obviously added. But there were also some, um, I would say, disadvantages uh, of that agreement versus the EU agreement. So, for example, on quotas, the EU uh, agreement with Japan uh, had 25 quotas. The UK uh, a version of that agreement had 10 quotas, and it's basically that. Uh, these quotas can be accessed if the EU doesn't um, max out the, 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 the quota the volume. So the, the, these are not as uh, advantageous, uh, um, as, as um, beneficial as, as they would uh, initially appear. Digital trade was, was uh, one of the big uh, issues discussed uh, when it came to the agreement with Japan and the fact that he has data flows, special provisions on, on uh, digital trade that were not covered in the 
uh, EU-Japan agreement. However, they are covered by the, one of the agreements that the UK is hoping to join, CPTPP, which I will mention in a second. So I'll come back to it in a second. So that from, for that reason, it was seen as a, a bit of a stepping stone towards the future, towards joining that big regional agreement, CPTPP, uh, and a preparation uh, for that and a forward uh, looking agreement. So now if you look at what we've gained versus what we've lost. So we, in many of these agreements, there are some small changes and, and, and tweaks like the one with Japan, where you know if you're in this industry where the tariffs are uh, liberalized quicker than the EU, uh, than in the, under the EU agreement, you know, there's a clear benefit for you. There, there's a clear uh, you know, uh, advantage versus EU uh, producers. However, in, in principle, you know, if we look at what we've lost, uh, we've lost the EU, and that very much can be felt if you if you you know if your supply chain includes the EU. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I have a few clients that pre-Brexit, for example, they would uh, sell from their UK manufacturer to a, a related company or a distributor in the EU, and from the EU they would then sell to Japan. Korea, Mexico, Canada, and so on. Now, before uh, Brexit, obviously, this could be easily done. They sell to the EU uh, from to one of the EU member states. From this uh, EU member state, this can be exported to uh, some of these trading partners under free trade agreements, the ones that the EU has with, with these countries. And obviously, that would be either tariff-free or reduced tariff rate. Now, because we've lost EU in these trade agreements, that is no longer possible. So the second you export something from the UK to the EU, the preferential tariff, the preferential status, origin, all of that is lost. So what happens now for these clients is if they sell through their distributor, and this is how they're set up, so obviously changing anything takes time, um, even if though this business model no longer makes sense, it will take time to, to adjust it and for them to set up their own distribution center in the UK. So they send it to the EU, to their distributor or to their headquarters or in a related company or, or whatever the system might be. And the second that entity wants to export to Japan, North Korea, Mexico, even, even though both the UK and the EU has a trade agreement with that third party, full tariffs are due there's no chance to use the UK trade agreement. So obviously that is, you know, that impacts more companies than these small tweaks in, in terms of tariffs and, and so on. And it impacts companies across the board, meaning in, in different industries. The other, the other thing worth mentioning here, when we look at how these trade agreements, this continuity, these continuity deals differ from what we've had as a, as a member uh, of the EU is, is accumulation. And that is a bit of a difficult uh, concept, but I'll try to <laughs> use an example here. Accumulation is basically about which products you can consider domestic and local when you're trying to meet rules of origin, when you're trying to demonstrate that your product is eligible for that discount under a trade agreement. Now, one of the uh, biggest achievements, in my opinion, of the UK government is something that I didn't think was possible, and I'm still very much impressed that, uh, that we managed to get that, was to convince all of the um, rollover partners, all of these uh, um, countries that we have a continuity deal with, to agree to something called cross-cumulation or extended cumulation. That basically means that if you are a UK producer and you're exporting to one of these countries, South Korea, Japan, Mexico, and you're using inputs from the EU or process, you know, goods that are coming into the UK after being processed in the EU or were made in the EU, you can still count that EU input, that EU origin, as if it was UK origin. So you can still calculate it and count it as domestic origin in the UK. And the partner country, though, Mexico, Japan, will treat it as such. So they will treat the EU content as if it was UK content. Um, so that's obviously um, a great support and benefit for UK companies that manufacture and produce. However, less so for UK companies that uh, produce inputs and parts and components because the EU did not do the same. So it works one way. If you are exporting from the UK to one of these countries, yes, you can use that simplification, well, not really simplification, but you can use that provision, you can accumulate this origin, you can 
treat EU content as UK content, but the EU did not reciprocate. So the second you send anything, and again, coming back to the example of a UK manufacturer, if you, for example, make parts and components uh, for something that's then uh, manufactured in the EU, so you sell your products to a different company in the EU and they uh, manufacture it into a final product and then export it from the EU. From the EU perspective, that UK component or part is now non-originating for the same country. So for Japan, if you know, if you do it through the UK, Japan will accept the EU content as, as originating. If you do it through the EU, Japan will not accept UK content as originating. So it's very one-sided and, and doesn't necessarily benefit. Um, I mean, it benefits some UK companies, the ones that export to these countries, but doesn't benefit uh, producers of, um, of parts and components or, or intermediate uh, uh, goods. So I think this is the, the biggest um, uh, difference is that we no longer have that scale that we no longer have the EU as part of of these agreements. Now things like data flows, um, some provisions on financial service and and so on, they are obviously important, but they're important to the industries or the the companies that they relate to. Uh, losing the EU, as I mentioned earlier, is important across the board to any company that has the EU in their supply chain. So I would still argue that we've lost more than we gained, but again, uh, it's good that we are where we are and have these uh, rollover agreements. Now, in terms of the future, we have a couple of agreements that will be, that are in the works and would actually be first bespoke uh, new trade agreements. Uh, the one that seems to be the closest uh, to, to uh, coming into force or being signed or, or being delivered is Australia, um, which is an interesting one. Um, it's been agreed in principle in June, although agreed in principle doesn't really <laughs> mean much because you can agree in principle in terms yeah. of the, the 80 or 90 percent of things that you agree on. Uh, and yet still have the 10% uh, of, of the difficult conversations to, to, um, to complete. And sometimes, as we've seen, when the EU was negotiating with Canada, it can be a fraction of a percent that's left, uh, one issue or two small issues, and that's where the delay can happen, or that's where a certain region can protest in 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 the Netherlands was Belgium, sorry. Belgium, yeah. Yes, uh, and 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 that's where the agreement can fall apart. So just because it's agreed in principle, um, that doesn't really mean much. But it seems to be the closest, and it seems to be uh, progressing. We don't have the text, so all we know about this agreement is is from press releases and and conversations. So we know there are some. Uh, benefits that the UK government is stressing, like the movement of uh, people for, for for young people to be able to go to Australia and work and and, and study, um, uh, some provisions for British lawyers that they will be able to practice uh, in Australia and that will be easier for them. There are some tariffs that will be apparently removed on on uh, scotch on on British uh, uh, auto industry for British auto industry. Um, and, and some other products as well. There's also uh, two quite um, uh, broadly, well, quite important issues that are being discussed at the moment. One is the, um, uh, the climate targets and the fact that uh, we seem to have dropped these, uh, which might go against uh, our, our general policy on climate, and obviously beef and agriculture products and the fact that uh, we, we, again, we haven't seen the actual text before, but there is a, a, a notion or there's a, the, the, we have some information to suggest that uh, the, the tariff quotas that were meant that were, were going to be put in place to protect UK farmers and UK producers are going to be set at a level which makes them uh, somewhat meaningless, meaning that it will increase the tariff free imports into the UK of products that are not necessarily uh, produced to the same standards as they will be produced in the UK. And that has caused uh, agriculture uh, lobbies and, 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 and companies and producers to, to protest. So these are things that are still outstanding and, and uh, under, under negotiations. We also have um, a proposed or a, a, an agreement with New Zealand that, that's also being negotiated a little bit behind Australia, as far as I'm aware. Uh, but but it is also one of the ones that that uh, is likely to um, 
be done or be signed in in uh, in the near future. We then have some of the uh, two agreements that are um, slightly longer term, uh, even if the UK government uh, would want them um, to materialize a bit quicker. And Liam mentioned the US, so that was obviously, you know, that's a headline. Uh, UK agrees uh, to uh, a trade agreement with, with um, the US, even though the EU was not able to do so. Uh, you know, so that there was a bit of a there was a bit of a um, wishful thinking about it when it comes to that agreement, um, and of course, it's an, as Liam mentioned, it's a very important uh, trading partner, so that agreement would make sense. Uh, however, there's um, there's less of a of an urgency from the Biden administration, and now that the trade authority has expired, the process will be. Uh, much more time consuming than we initially hoped. We're definitely not at the um, at the front of the queue. And even if we were, free trade agreements are nowhere near the top of the priority list for the EU, United, United States. Uh, you know, that, 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 that kind of continues that very much of uh, an inward looking administration at the moment and sorting out uh, some of the domestic problems rather than signing new uh, trade agreements. Uh, we have India as well, which is which was announced as a, a um, as a prospective deal, and the work has started in some impact assessment and scoping exercises. That one is going to be quite difficult. It will be a, it will be an important trade agreement, given uh, the the level of tariffs and the protectionism in in India. However, India is a uh, very well known is is very well known for for being difficult when it comes to trade negotiations, not only on bi bilateral um, level but also here in Geneva in terms of uh, multilateral WTO negotiations. India is is not an easy country to negotiate with, so we'll see how that one goes. And then obviously we have the CPTPP, which is the 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 one that uh, I've mentioned before. This is the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a mouthful. And it has uh, 11 nations uh, around the Trans-Pacific area. UK would be the first one outside that region. If you look at the map of where these countries are, and 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 it's very very much a regional trade agreement, and we're nowhere near the region. But it's also a a very uh, progressive um, uh, kind of uh, very kind of. Um, uh, an agreement that includes a high level of, of provisions when it comes to standards and and um, and other areas and obviously uh, trade um, liberalization of tariffs. It has a high level of um, trade and services liberalization, uh, whereby it it uh, assumes that everything that's not mentioned in the trade agreement is liberalized. So instead of making a list of things that you services that you would liberalize under this trade agreement, you make a list of of exceptions, which is a uh, um, more kind of liberal way to do it. So yeah, this is an, another um, large um, block that that uh, the UK is thinking to join. I think one one important point to make, because I've seen these kind of comments on us mostly on Twitter, uh, that the UK left the EU and now wants to join the CPTPP. Even though CPTPP is a regional agreement, it's very very different than. Mm -hmm. the it's a free trade agreement, nothing but a free trade agreement. It's it's a bigger free trade agreement, it's a regional free trade agreement, but it's nowhere near the level of integration that the EU has. It's not a customs union, it's not a common market, it's not a free movement of um, um, people or services or, or goods, none of that. It's a free trade agreement, it's a classical free trade agreement only with more members. So there are some fears around the UK joining CPTPP and what that would mean. It's still very much just a free trade agreement, high level free trade agreement in terms of um, a level of uh, liberalization, but still only a free trade agreement. So no free movement of people uh, and, and all, everything else that's included with the EU, like for common currency and all of that, none of that. And um, also not much in terms of um, policy setting or, or standards or things like that. It's still a free trade agreement. So I think I will, uh, I will stop uh, here. As I mentioned, these, 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 um, these trade agreements in progress, Australia and New Zealand are uh, realistically likely to happen in, in, the, in the short term. Um, US and, and India are long-term project and our our kind of accession to CPTPP is ongoing, but we'll 
also take a bit of time to negotiate with all the 11 separate members of the CPTPP. Yeah, th thank you for that. And I'm going to stop sharing there uh, just to take the slides off and it'll give us a, an opportunity to see the chat and the, the Q&A as well. But just continuing that discussion about the you know, what you're talking about in the CPTPP, uh, I mean, there, there's kind of symbolism, is, isn't there, uh, with uh, the agreement we've, we, we've made with Japan, who are leading on behalf of the CPTPP in the negotiations. The negotiations with Australia as a stepping stone to CPTPP because Australia is a member of CPTPP, as is New Zealand. And this is a kind of long-term possibility that the US might decide that it also uh, wants to be in CPTPP. So to what degree is do you think the reach an agreement with Australia and New Zealand is symbolic uh, of a move towards CPTPP, or is it symbolic of UK government really for the first time being able to say, we've got something that the EU didn't give? You know, we've got more countries in agreement with us in trade uh, than, than, you know, that we've got something extra, if you like. So is there symbolism at play here? I mean, of, of course, I mean, the whole, the whole idea of, of joining CPTPP could be viewed as we are demonstrating to the rest of the world that our move, uh, uh, that the Brexit in general wasn't about protectionism, that we just did not want to be part of the EU anymore, but we're not a protectionist nation and we do want to trade globally and we're open to free trade and so on and so forth. So just that, that decision to try to Join CPTPP in itself was, to me, a very symbolic kind of uh, uh, gesture on, on UK's part, as I mentioned. Nowhere near the region, there's very little, um, yeah, we're, we're very far away from all the all the countries that are members of the CPP, CPTPP. Um, in terms of Australia, it, it's quite funny because we were talking about how, before the seminar, about how um, Australia is play, playing obviously both fronts because they're also negotiating with uh, EU and as mm. with New Zealand and, and they have a bit of a um, uh, yeah um, way, they have a way of, of kind of playing this interest against each other but it's yeah. fun to see how the agreement with the continuity agreement with Japan was reached in, in, in relatively short yeah. time, six months uh, and was announced as, as a kind of stepping stone towards uh, CPTPP. And now with Australia, this is where the UK government is realizing that negotiating free trade isn't always as easy as it was with the continuity deals, with beef, with some of these uh, issues that are still Absolutely. outstanding. I think they've kind of hit the hit the wall, wall here and, and realizing that uh, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't always take six months. No, it, 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 do, it doesn't. And, and of course, the, the other kind of big factor that's worth mentioning is that the, the net, the gain uh, from trade with Australia, I think I'm right in saying, was around 0.02% potentially, which in, a, in statistical terms has got a plus or minus. It may indeed be less. Uh, but they, you know, we talk about beef and so on. Uh, uh, of course, we bring uh, uh, wine from Australia and, and, and so on. So we are importing from that country, despite it being uh, quite far away. So there are, uh, and, and I think that the services element uh, are, are probably less able to be measured, but but nonetheless, uh, movement of people and, and services would be would be a, a benefit. I'm going to turn now, Anna, uh, to uh, some questions that we've got in, in the chat and come to uh, uh, come to those. And um, uh, you, I think you already uh, answered one before when, when when I was speaking to er er Erica Marsh, or uh, who was uh, who says you know they're trading through Amazon uh, now have a German VAT number set up via Amazon. Uh, and their, their agent. Um, it's a solution they took up. However, they're unable to send any stock to the Amazon warehouse in Germany as customs are asking for an established business address in the EU. Uh, do you have anyone we can approach for advice? Well, actually, Anna very quickly responded that the Chamber of Customs uh, uh, provides an advisory service uh, and we have an advisory service. And, and so uh, be remiss of me not to mention that, that, that if you go to chambercustoms.co.uk, just complete a short inquiry form. Someone will uh, get in touch with you, uh, Erica, um, uh, directly. And, and Anna, in fact, is one of our advisors who, who, who deals with uh, helps businesses to understand the new complexities of sending goods between uh, UK and, uh, and, and the EU. Um, so uh, uh, hopefully that answers uh, uh, that, that kind of brief question uh, for you, uh, Anna. Um, the... Uh, 
Uh, Claudia Gambarucci is asking some very specific questions on exporting spirits to the EU. Um, uh, she's saying that all countries uh, of the EU request different certificate or document. Is it not possible to have a standard? Well, actually, but maybe, maybe there is. Um, and, and the difficulty in sending a, a sample to an importer, especially in Italy and Greece, and uh, where can we f find the list of trade agreement countries and info regarding alcohol and also on the tariff? So this is around the spirits business. So let's take it as about uh, um, excise goods uh, uh, that, that every country deals with uh, in bringing spirits or tobacco uh, or uh, uh, you know uh, diesel, petrol, fuels into the country treated as excise goods. So there are special arrangements uh, for the movement of, 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 of spirits. Um, in terms of a standard document, of course, each member state um, uh, has their own customs authority. And this is one area where, uh, you know, I think we're right in saying, Anna, that, that they determine their own uh, forms. Uh, indeed, um, I think early in the whole process in January and February, we were dealing with the, the different coloured inks for different countries. Apparently, I don't know if you remember that, there's been so much happened since, but we had a uh, uh, a trader who sent a document, I think, in blue ink to Norway and the same document in green ink to, to, to the Netherlands or red ink to the Netherlands. And uh, one was accepted, one was, no, it was, it was the same colour ink to both countries, but one country, I think the Netherlands, insisted they needed a different coloured ink. Um, uh, that, that, we are hearing less about that being an issue, but the, the, whilst the certification and documents may vary, Typically, the contents are broadly similar. Would you agree with that, Anna? That, they, that they're asking the same question; they're just asking it in a different format. Mm. Yeah, and, and with, with alcohol, like obviously, because you have customs regulation and customs forms plus excise on top of it. Yeah, uh, and excise is one of these things that are is not harmonised uh, in terms of EU member states. There are only some limits, upper and lower limits, that are harmonised, and everything else is not harmonised. So that makes it very difficult to move goods. Yeah. It, it, it does. And, and so you, you really, uh, Claudia, um, you, you really need to uh, go and study the content of each uh, country that you're exporting to uh, and the conditions that they place. And, and typically, I think you'll find that uh, by going to the member states, uh, customs and excise or customs authority um, uh, website and content. Um, uh, just to mention in terms of samples, people, people often say, look, it's only samples I'm importing, it's only samples I'm exporting, but in customs terms, when it comes to excise goods, they all have to be accounted for. Um, I, and the other element of that, I mean, not related to samples, but uh, in terms of moving excise goods is, is whether you're moving them uh, into a customs warehouse before they reach their final destination, and the point at which you have to account for any duties and taxes that may be payable on them. So uh, moving excise goods is more complicated than standard goods. Uh, um, and, and that's because, of course, um, uh, countries want to be able to collect, uh, and member states want to be able to collect those taxes and duties uh, that, may become, that may become due. So hopefully that has uh, answered uh, something of a question, Claudia. If you need specialist advice, then Chamber Customs, and there are others, uh, um, uh, our Chambers uh, network across the country um, uh, are, are uh, um, very well uh, uh, set up to be able to answer some basic questions. If you need not guidance, but you need advice, then there are some Chambers and a of course, Chamber Customs too that can offer uh, those services. Uh, <clears throat> and in fact, um, uh, uh, if I go to this next question, we know that South Korea uses the approved exporter status only for preferential mm -hmm. trade. What are the other countries that, that, that only use approved exporter but not accepting UK ER ones? This is from Nick Patrick, who's a colleague in the Chamber Network, who, you know, even my, coll my colleagues in the Chamber Network have got uh, questions. And I know that Nick uh, is very much uh, um, uh, very knowledgeable on authorised economic operator uh, uh, and, and people applying for that kind of status. Uh, but this is about approved export, Anna. Any light you can shine on uh, countries that use uh, AES but don't I think accept? Japan is one of these uh, as well, where it's basically there's a move towards self-certification uh, in all newer trade agreements. So we're going, we're moving away from paper certificates like Euro ones and moving towards self-certification by either exporter or importer. So we're going to yeah. see more and more of that. We have the same with the EU trade agreement. Uh, the only problem is that obviously on the UK side, on the EU side, it's not just 
self-certification, you have to get this approved exporter, which you don't always have uh, in other countries. Like in Canada, you mm. don't have that. You just self-certify. You don't have to get the approved exporter. So the approved exporter is a limitation. Well, not limitation. It makes there are absolute there are reasons for having it and actually helps in terms of compliance but it is this kind of oh yes you have to first apply to your local customs authorities to get that number so then you can self-certify and obviously we also have recs in the eu so yeah. we have those this dual kind of uh scheme it's not always the approved exporter sometimes it's it's recs as well it, we um we've heard from the HMRC, well, we've heard from HMRC that we're not, no longer going to have approved exporter in the UK. Um, right. So so we'll just be able to self-certify in, in the UK, meaning we won't have that uh, that additional step uh, going forward. The, 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 it seems to still be around, but the unoffic- and I've not seen official guidance, but I've unofficial guidance from HMRC is we're moving away from approved exporter. We'll just be self-certifying. So. Yeah, and, and it's worth saying at this point that the, I mean, the, the kind of, I'll call it traditional, you referred to the, the EUR1, uh, uh, you know, moving away from paper tell it to, to something that's self-certification. I should, and my colleagues would say it's remiss of me not to say that actually uh, most of the certificates that are issued EUR1s are, are by their nature electronic, but often banks and other authorities require to see the paper version uh, of it so the people end up printing it out. Um, it's also worth saying that whilst you can self-certify, um, chambers of commerce uh, uh, and customs authorities that issue uh, EUR ones uh, um, for gaining preferential tariff, um, it's often the buyer of the goods that wants a, a, a trusted third party in a chamber of commerce or a tax authority to provide that certification. So whilst there are provisions and trade agreements for self-certification, it's often buyer behaviour that says, actually, that's all very well you're self-certifying, but I'd like a third party to agree with you. Uh, and so chambers have a role, and if people need preferential certificates of origin, uh, um, then uh, our chamber network, uh, you know, some 60 locations across the UK are there to serve the business community in providing uh, those. Um, and that's like a discount voucher for entering another market. Um, an interesting question uh, uh, here on... Uh, uh, on um, uh, Amazon, Trisha Kluet is saying, we publish books, books via Amazon. They're printed on demand by Amazon. So it's a service, really, but there's a tangible product at the end. Not printed by uh, uh, Trisha, but printed by Amazon. So we have no physical product. She has no physical product uh, here. Um, I, and I'm presuming those books are going to multiple markets, uh, uh, Trisha. She's saying, are, are we okay to simply continue declaring the income from Amazon um, uh, in the UK? <laughs> so many, so many, so many questions in the question, though, Anna. You know, which markets are the books going to? Where are they? Where are they leaving from and going to? Um, and and to what degree are you a service? And to what degree actually, who, who's responsible for the product? Is a question. Things like that with um, e-commerce. I mean, e-commerce in general is is an area that uh, only now the WTO is thinking of maybe regulating this and providing a better guidance on this. But with things like that, you have to, you have so many things. Kind of, you know, you're simply providing a, a service, but you have the okay. Yes, where is the good when when it's actually made? As Liam said, is it crossing an international border? Uh, if so, customs formalities. Then you have uh, the, the division of income and, and, and other taxes, and, and how you how you know how you how you structure this. That's more than one area that's in, included and covered by one of this by, by this question. It's not only customs. It's 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 going to be uh, local taxes. It's going to be establishment rules. It's going to be quite a lot that that goes into it, and it would require properly looking into into this yeah. and, and yeah. one of the reasons and i think for other questions as well one of the reasons why we're not responding to questions like this in detail with a simple yes or no answer is because first of all these are not simple yes or no questions but to mm-hmm. answer it we would have to actually uh which we do with our, our consulting clients spent i spent an hour uh asking for about details and, 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 and follow-up questions to understand what the scenario is before i start looking into this so yeah. It, it's not as a question that you can line in, write no. in three lines. It, it requires much more information for anyone to even start to understand what the what the movement is and and start to provide advice. 
Exactly, and that, that, that's that's why I said there are so many so many questions in that question. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that that would be very you know specific to Trisha's uh, uh, scenario, and uh, uh, that that um, it's just impossible to answer what seems like a simple question uh, with a simple answer. There are there are many answers depending on the circumstance. Um, uh, just to, to get back to accumulation, Anna, um, the. Uh, Jeremy uh, Harris is saying, you know, in negotiating with separate CPTPP countries uh, uh, like Australia, New Zealand, and, and we've already got the agreement with Japan, is the UK looking for cumulation? Would cumulation be uh, a part of that agreement uh, with CPTPP? Because my, I mean, my understanding is that in acceding to the CPTPP, it's not a negotiation to rewrite the CPTPP rules. It's a if you if you exceed, you have to accept them as they stand. Is cumulation yeah. part of that, Anna? Yeah, cumulation is uh, as with any trade agreement, you would expect to see cumulation between all the members of trade agreements, and that is actually from a kind of customs trade and goods perspective, one of the benefits, if not the key benefit, of joining CPTPP given that we already have trade agreements with nine out of the 11 or planning to have uh, trade agreements with nine out of the 11, the ability to accumulate, you know, for, for us to produce in, in one of these countries and then send to another country, that's the benefit of, of having a regional trade agreement versus bilateral ones. Absolutely. So, so I mean, that, that's, that's clearly something that, that uh, uh, we'd we be part of that. And, and uh, you know, we see in the Japan agreement that accumulation a, a lot in the in the Japan agreement about accumulation was really about the motor car industry and protecting, mm, yeah. uh, you know, existing trade in, in the UK and for Japan so that that could continue uh, to function. Uh, but of course, it's been very welcomed and, and Anna very eloquently described the one way traffic that, that's involved in that. Uh, of course, we, we got we got a, a, a couple of questions relating to um Goods moving from UK to EU. Um, uh, 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 Elena said, just to be clear, don't UK companies need to transform, i.e., you know, significantly change a commodity code, a product commodity code, uh, for goods from the EU to make them of UK origin? Um, there's some confusion, she says, about extended communication. No worries. Communication so many... <laughs> journal is one of these things that when you talk about, you just have to stop and like draw it out in your brain before you can actually um, <laughs> explain it to anyone else. Cumulate is it just, yeah, it's one of these. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that depends. Cumulation is not for the purpose of UK, EU, it's from the UK to the next country. So the, 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 uh, assumption is that if you're exporting to Mexico, you would have done something with these products that you, you can't just, well, that depends how you, how you kind of, which product it is and what the rule of origin is, but it's not about bringing a good in from, um, from the EU, bringing it into the UK and just shipping it to Mexico without any processing. It's not that. It's when you bring a component from the EU and you manufacture the product and that component can then be considered a UK uh, component, an originating component. So uh, yes, there, 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 there's a difference between just shipping something and, and making it. Yes, the product, the, the actual product, the final product that is exported under preference or imported under preference needs to meet the rules of origin requirements. One of them is they have to be substantially processed, yes. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and, and, and that, you know, accumulation is, is complex because there are a number of variety of variations in the theme uh, uh, right up to full accumulation. So uh, hopefully that's that's uh, made things a bit clearer. But again, uh, accumulation is complex, particularly when you have a variety of inputs and, 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 and depending on what your output, uh, final output is, and you should take advice uh, on uh, on declaring origin. And again, our chambers across the country can, can help with that. I'm going to go to Josh uh, uh, McCabin. Uh, and a couple of other quick fire questions. This is about, yeah. I think, most favoured nation uh, imports into the UK. So uh, imports from Ghana of uh, Kente, a Ghanaian textile to the UK, is that tariff free? And just to pull, push, uh, pull that together with a, another question uh, on uh, goods from Tunisia, I think, that came from, uh, let me find it. Um, let me see. Ah, uh, if I manufacture goods in Tunisia, will I qualify for free trade for importing those goods? I'm presuming Adrian Moult is talking about into the UK. So goods from Tunisia, goods from Ghana, are they going to be tariff free when they arrive in the UK as textile products? Oh, that's, that's one of these questions you can't uh, answer. Uh, 
Ghana is one of the GSP countries. Correct. So, yeah. uh, product, but then again, you would have to look at the commodity. <laughs> you would have to look at the, it's not automatic. Even no. from GSP countries, you have to meet rules of origin. And for textile, they're quite uh, um, uh, difficult. Uh, so we would have to look at the, in principle, there are options because it is a GSP country, but um, we would have to look at the specific uh, commodity you, you, for that product. You would, but if we if if we were to kind of make a presumption that the kente is uh, produced in Ghana using Ghanaian materials uh, and woven into a textile, and then and then it's shipped as a Ghanaian origin product to the UK, the likelihood is that yeah. it would be tariff free. Uh, but you should always check. Product is included, yeah. yes, because yeah, not all uh, products are always included. Yes. Yeah, uh, Tunisia. Um, um, I'm not sure. I don't. Uh, not entirely sure. I would have to check that. I, again, we'd need to look. And actually, there's a, um, yeah. a, a, a how to import, how to export goods. There's a new uh, um, a UK government product coming online, I think, next Monday that is going to assist businesses with classifying goods. So you, you're basically going to find the classification of your goods, determine which country you import or export from, and you'll get some top level information. But uh, um, I, I'll be Thank interested to... I'd be interested to get feedback on it, Anna, because I think you need to have a, a level of knowledge to be able to use the tool, uh, which I is say ironic. Every single time you have to, well, you know, if there is a trade agreement, there isn't. Every single time you have to check your specific product and your specific commodity code. You do. Even if there's a trade agreement, you, your product might be excluded. Trade Indeed. agreements don't cover all the products. So I, I check everything every single time. Yeah. Uh, there's a... Uh, yeah, so, so just I'm conscious of time, two minutes to go. Um, uh, and just to, to finish off, I thought we'd come to, and then finally from uh, Naomi Smith, who asked a really interesting question, given COP26 is coming up. Yes, you know, what the, So one. what will be the carbon impact of doing more trade with countries further away, such as Australia and New Zealand, and less as a proportion of the total with our nearest neighbours, presuming Naomi is talking about the European Union, and what does this mean for global Britain, its reputation, especially given upcoming COP26? COP26. A really uh, fabulous question, Naomi. Thank you for that one. So, Anna, 30 yeah, seconds. So <laughs> that, that can be slightly uh, counterintuitive. Uh, it's a very interesting topic in general, how this global shipping and, and global supply chains impact um, uh, carbon emissions. Uh, Alan Beatty from FT, I believe, did a, a very interesting piece on this, I think, last year, talking about the fact that just because something is produced far away doesn't necessarily make it uh, more carbon intensive than producing something. So if you think of uh, producing uh, citruses in the EU where they need greenhouses and, and they uh, they need additional energy to, to produce them versus producing them somewhere sunny and then shipping, the fact not everything that's being shipped uh, would be produced as um, uh, in, a, in, a, in an equally efficient way closer to home. So the fact that something is shipped from far away doesn't necessarily make it more carbon intensive. Uh, I don't have a link uh, to that, uh, to that uh, piece, uh, but it was very interesting to say that it's just not always necessarily that simple, that yeah. shipping something from far away, yes, in principle, yes, but in, in, it's not always that uh, the relationship isn't that easy. It, it could be more complicated than that, but yeah. it, for sure, I think Naomi makes a, a, a reasonable yeah, point. And, and, you know, the transportation industry is 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 looking at hydrogen powered ships, looking at its carbon output. And, you know, as you say, um, uh, driving a 40 foot trailer from uh, uh, Cyprus uh, into the UK with something that we could already produce in the UK doesn't make sense uh, if, we, if we can avoid that. So I, I suspect, that, Naomi, this will be part, a feature of our continued discussion around trade and thinking of the impact of trade and a whole range of, of areas, uh, including on uh, uh, the impact that it has on the planet and how we how we trade, what we buy, uh, what we consume, uh, and how we and, and how we all behave. Uh, we've all got a role to play in that. So, thank you, everyone who's asked questions. I'm sorry that I didn't get to all of them. Very uh, interesting uh, questions and, that we have an answer as well. <laughs> some really some really interesting ones in there, Anna. I, I, I couldn't agree yeah. more. Um, uh, but you know, if you uh, the chamber network is still here, go to your local chamber uh, for those questions you've asked us. A lot of those your local chamber can ask and uh, answer. And if they don't know the answer, they can come to us for 
for the help in doing that, but I encourage you to do that. Anna and the Chamber Customs team are uh, stand ready to help you with uh, uh, further advice. And also there's some questions in there about clearing goods in the UK. Chamber Customs can clear goods at any port in the UK. Uh, so if you're regularly importing and exporting, uh, do come to us on your brokerage needs too, and we'll make sure your goods get cleared uh, and are compliantly cleared with, by, uh, by HMRC. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll also send you news of the next time we have a webinar. Uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you.